Well, hello, hello, Kelly. I am so happy to have you on the Virtual Art Summit and the podcast for a second time. So you're special lucky for all of us. I know. We're like, Kelly's the max. It's like Kelly's taking over the world. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. <laughs> we should. Definitely Kelly conversations all the time because you're one of my favorite people to talk to. Oh, I mean, for a lot of reasons, but also because we're very kindred in our, our dreams and our desires and how we connect with the world and the magic and the art and just the way you talk about things just always leaves me feeling so good. So I always love talking to you. Oh, thank you. It's just, you know, when something really lights you up and it feels like your mission, your purpose, your passion, say, like, how can you not talk about that to people? Right. And I kind of get it when people get quite religious because it's kind of like that, but in a slightly different way, like through my art, I think. So yeah, yeah. it's, um, it's unavoidable. It's going to happen. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you about it. Yeah, creative living becomes the religion. I like that. That's fine with me. That's about the one that I can resonate with the most, which is why we connect. Uh, so thank you so much for joining the Virtual Arts Summit this year. And I love having you in it because you really do tap into that play and the whole theme of returning to play. I think your whole life has been a journey of that, right? Oh my gosh, yeah. I am um, like, I think if my friends and family describe me like fun or playful or mischievous, would definitely be like in the top three words. And I, I don't know about anybody else listening or watching, but I just don't feel like I've ever really grown up and I refuse to. So take it and take it how you want. But Thanks I don't think you should have to grow up. So there you yeah. go. Yeah. Well, you were on the podcast before and so you gave a little bit of your backstory then. And I wouldn't mind yeah. just refreshing a little bit, especially want to tap into what it was like being raised on the fair, in the fair with the traveling family. And I want to like, like we talked about like how that's influenced your work in the past, but I'd love to like, just hear some of those playful stories, like some memories. Oh gosh. Yeah. So I suppose to me, it was not serious because I was a kid, but like it is serious because it's your life, but being from the fairground family and being itinerant for a better word or a traveling community or whatever teaches you to be really irreverent and rebellious and a lot of things are very temporary so you kind of just go for it and you do what's in the moment and you know some days you've taken quite a bit of money and you'll have steak for tea and other days you don't have anything so I think it does take it teaches you how to hold things perhaps a little bit more lightly and just kind of be in the moment which I think are all really important ingredients for being playful and letting go of all that perfectionism and all that heavy stuff so I mean, I was thinking about this actually yesterday about where did we play when we were kids? And um, we lived in a great big coach built wagon, like about 40 feet long. Don't know what that is in meters for people. Um, and my parents had a bedroom at one end and we had a bedroom. Me and my two sisters had a bedroom at the other. And then there was kitchen and living space in between. And it was like if you lay down on the floor, like one body shape was like the floor space. So I can't really remember, apart from having a Cindy house in the lounge, I don't really remember having indoor toys at all. I just remember being outside to play all the time because yeah. there just wasn't the room or the space in the wagon. So now I play in nature all the time. That is like my ideal playground. I'm thinking, ah, oh, now I get it. Because, you know, that's where I used to be out on my BMX. You know, we're talking late 70s, early 80s. So I was out on my BMX, I was out on my roller skates, mm -hmm. or just out kind of... Um, I don't know, just like digging with sticks and looking for dead exactly. birds to bury and just stuff like that. Yeah. That yeah. was my childhood too. And I didn't even have the fun of being in the fair, but like we spent a lot of time outdoors just like figuring things out, digging with sticks. Yeah. Who would have ever thought, you know? I know. Hey, why didn't why don't we dig with sticks anymore? But I think what what other people thought was really playful about the fairground, about like the fun house and the dodgems and stuff like that was so everyday to us. That right. it wasn't fun and playful. It kind of is, but it was like we looked at other things to like going on little adventures and those times where you didn't, you know, have to be working or, or doing things because even as a kid, you know, everybody pitches in. So they were like, like I said, those moments out on your bike or something. And then when we did interact with our own things, like we had a ghost train. And I remember my dad on a number of occasions when we weren't open with the fair equipment, he would um, take the carriages off and turn it into like an indoor party venue. And we had birthday parties in there. And mm. the dodgem track was just ideal at night or at, when we weren't open to push the cars to one side. And we would all go on and roller skate on it because it's like the perfect place to roller skate. Oh. So we kind of took what you guys all thought was fun, but we like twisted it and made it our own and like made it a bit alternative for us so it wasn't like the everyday you know so yeah playful and um individual 
did you get to interact with the other um, circus performers or fair performers or whatever? Yeah, yeah. So there aren't really many performers on the fair. It's more like um, rides and equipment and things like that in the okay. U- in the UK. Yeah, I know in America it's a bit more mixed, but in the UK, circus is quite separate. So, um, so yeah, we would. It's interesting because different families come together on different fairs. So, like my best friends, we would see each other at fair x and y but we wouldn't see each other at fair z because they'd go off to a separate fair and we'd go to this one so those moments of celebration as well when you when you came together with your friends like you knew that there were certain fairs that were just the best ever because your mates were going to be there like your best mates (laughs) you have friends everywhere but so i think you really learn to like um celebrate play and make it your own and find those moments of presence and i definitely feel like that is something that's kind of followed me all the way through into adulthood now how how seeing as how a lot of your time was spent outside when did art start becoming a bigger part of your life well early 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 doors I do remember painting the equipment with my dad um, and he would sign right and paint um, the characters and things on the stalls and the different things and I remember very clearly doing that from like teeny teeny age and then, um, as I've told you before, you know, I was raised on the fair and then I went to Hogwarts, which is pretty much, you know, the, the mini version of my life story. And when I was eight, I went to boarding school and there I was kind of exposed to a normal, in, in you know, speech marks, a normal education. And I guess that's where I started to play more like you guys would in um, early, you know, early school settings. I hadn't had so much of that before. Um, so, yeah, I kind of just followed that the same as anyone would through their school years, really. Um, And weirdly, I held this story that um, my best friend was great at art to like when we were 16, 17, she was going off to art college and stuff. And I was really interested in drama at the time. And I used to tell myself and I only realized a few years ago how long I'd carried this weird creative story block in my mind was that she was the art one. So I couldn't possibly be the art one. And I therefore was the drama one because that was free and available. So I would take that. So she'd take, oh. and it, it, it was very, very strange. And I also remember doing um, an exam project all about fairground script and writing and stuff with my teacher not being very, um, let's say not being very supportive about it. Mm. Um, so I think those things kind of pushed me away from it in my early adult life. And then the midlife comes doesn't it mm-hmm. and you go what the hell am I doing in this big corporate job or this big position or whatever it is and as I turned 40 I was like no I've got to change all this uh you know I haven't really grown up what am I doing this is also heavy and so difficult why am I doing this to myself life doesn't have to be like this and I started to go back to art classes and then to paint properly and go out on art, art holidays I volunteered and went into um, an international photography festival as an invigilator. I went um, and acted in a Shakespeare play. I did all these really creative things, but it was the painting that absolutely hooked me, Mm -hmm. you know, like, and has not let go. It's cool to hear that story because I can see the connection with your passion for helping other women at this age and having been in corporate and motherhood and whatever else that we get bogged down by. And that process of you trying so many different things to come back to living a creative life. Now it's like, okay, I can see how that all connects together in such a beautiful way. And I love the way your artwork is so playful and touches on nature in a regular, like actual literal sense, because you like to go out and adventure, find the symbolism, find the nature, find the connection of, of body, mind, spirit, and nature into the artwork. And and that's why the work speaks to me and the lessons you teach speak to me in that same way. Like there's really something soul connecting about it. Yeah, it feels like, I'm going to say Rob Hopkins, might be Bob Hopkins, but there's a a book called Spiritual Ecology. It's a collection of essays about sort of universal connection, animism, sort of spiritual Mm. connection to Mother Earth and the planet and the universe. And it's got all sorts of wonderful essays from different people. And in one of the essays, it says something along the lines of what's the biggest conversation you could have with the universe? And I was like, oh, (laughs) oh, it was like it really like entranced me. It hit me. It got me. It was emotional. And then I just thought this, you know, I, I'm not really wanting to do pet portraits or portraits or urban sketching. The biggest conversation I can have with the universe for me is through my creativity. If nature is creation, I'm part of nature. Therefore, 
I am creation. So how can I tap into that green spirit and kind of let it flow through me? And I've heard a lot of artists talk about this, like I didn't paint it, something painted through me. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying I channel anything, but it's just, you know, this, this universal nature connected spirit and a sort of abundance of creativity in nature is us. And when I'm out adventuring, I'm walking, I'm hiking, I have a kayak, I paint in my kayak, <laughs> even though it's quite wobbly. Um, you know, doing all these things just brings me into a really grounded, connected place, this conversation with the universe. But it's fun and it's inspiring and it's uplifting and it's free and I can breathe and there's room and, you know, it's very presence making as well. So, so yeah, that's why I love it. I, I don't find it serious and heavy and difficult to be out in nature. It's not an extreme sport for me. It's, um, it's like a, the best lounge or front room or, or sort of extra yeah. room on your house that you could possibly have. It's like, you know, yeah. Narnia. You open the door in Narnia and it's, wow, that's I what all of it. Is. You're making it so magical, which is why I think that you keep tapping into that element of magic that we quickly lose from our childhood. You know, yeah. and that is really where the play comes in, opening our eyes and seeing the magic that's still there in front of us. And I, I, and again, I will bring back your sky before, b b sky before screen, screen, sorry, yeah. sky no, before okay. screen, um, but I it was like sky before you sit and look at that little dumb dopey thing all day long, because that's what I do yeah, sometimes, yeah. but it's the <laughs> idea of reconnecting with that abundance of nature of, of just, it is, it's plentiful. We forget how plentiful it still is, even though it yeah. feels like we're quickly killing it all off, which is part of your reframe is let's still look at how we can connect with nature now and appreciate it and be present with it and nurture it and, and allow, allow it to nurture us. And yeah. I, I love that about. Infinitely magical and infinitely generous. And if you can't play in a magical, generous, ever-changing, beautiful, inspiring place, then I'm not sure where you're going to be able to play. You know, it's kind right. of like, the ultimate playground and I, I do understand that everybody is an outdoorsy person because you know there's flies and sand and rain and wind and all those things but I can bet you that everybody's a nature person in some way even people who love to sit indoors appreciate a gorgeous bouquet of flowers on their birthday or get the Christmas tree at Christmas or you know love homemade fruit and veg or eat amazing salads you know there's even just the idea of turning your tap on and seeing water flow and, and laying in a bath full of water or a shower you don't have to be fully outside in hiking boots to appreciate nature. You know, right. everybody's got a sky. That's why I love sky before screen is because even if you don't walk 20 miles before you look at your phone, you can stand with your cup of coffee in the morning by your bed and look out of your window. I would imagine unless you're living in a nuclear bunker, we've all got a window to look out of, you know, so yeah. it's very accessible. We're hoping we're not getting to the nuclear bunker thing anytime in our lifetimes. No. I know what you mean. It's like, um, Nature comes in so many forms besides just like being the outdoorsy hiking kind of person. Nature is yeah. like what we did this week was we had a slightly warmer late winter, early spring day. It was still chilly enough and we created a big bonfire in a back patio on the in the fire pit. And we just sat there for a couple of hours with the fresh air and the conversation and like that real connection again you know and so we didn't have yeah. to go, we didn't have to do much we just you know bundled up with our, our coats on and sat in front of the fire and and there was just like you know that beautiful dancing of the light and the conversation and the air mm. it's like yeah you're right it doesn't take much except for to make the decision that instead of Netflix instead of my phone instead of the to-do list which is what I get burned with so much is to make that choice to do something else for just a, an hour or two just the moment yeah just that moment um, and That's when you think the about inspiration it, for creativity comes from. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're surrounded. It's quite um, an arrogant thing to think that we're like nothing is man-made because everything we make anything with is of nature. So right. even synthetic well, things are actually kind of like natural molecules repurposed in the lab or whatever. But right. <laughs> you're you're never actually far from nature, even when you're sat in your house, or if you, even if you're in a really tall apartment block or an office block or whatever, you know. There's air all around you in your lungs. It, it's all, it's literally always there. And also I really try and help people understand that we're of nature and not to see ourselves as this right. separate, separate species. You know, we're part of what's going on and you just have to, you know, 
feel the difference in your body when you're stressed in front of a screen and then when you go and sit in front of your bonfire and you go ah, you know you know you're of nature because you move with it and you, you kind of find a rhythm with it I think yeah well, and so talk to me a little bit more about how you bring nature into your artwork, because yes, you have so a lot of nature scenes and you spend time in nature, but it seems to me like you're almost ready to like smear dirt on the page and make it playful <laughs> on that way. Like I've I can done that. I've done that. doing that. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have. I've done that. So yeah, I mean, obviously I'm landscape artist or nature inspired florals sometimes and things as well, but, but that over and above itself, you know, you could sit in a studio inside and never need to go out and paint for photos right so so you're quite right I I tend to have unless it's a commission for someone I tend to have a rule that I don't paint somewhere that I haven't stood or been mm. because you know it's lovely to see pretty images on Instagram or Pinterest but I, I need to feel like what did it feel like was it really windy could I hear birds you know was there a thorn poking through my trousers all those sorts of things I need to know so that's one sort of guiding way that I bring the nature into my art but then you're right you know I have smeared uh mud on my canvas and I'm sure that many of us have let you know you've been outdoor sketching which I love to do I love being outside making art and you just let the rain if it rains let, let let the rain fall on your painting see what happens you know let it give its own dynamic pick up a stick and um, dip it in your paint and scribble with it and um, you know get your hands involved so you'll see in the lesson for the summit we're using hands and we're using sticks and that's because um they're a part of us. So when you're gesturing and when you're painting and making marks with something like your fingers, it's it's directly you onto the canvas. You don't have to transfer your energy or your creativity through a stick or a brush or a roller or any of those things. It's literally you, as close as you're ever going to get to your canvas or your paper. Fingers. And it, your fingers. And they do incredible things. You know, <laughs> this is millions and millions of years of evolution. Uh, <laughs> put that up against a brush, you know. And of course, right. brushes are amazing and do incredible things. I love good brushes. But yeah, your fingers, we're so um, prim and proper sometimes about things. And that's why I love your theme of, of Return to Play, because when did most of us last finger paint? Probably when we were in kindergarten or primary school. Yeah. And actually, it's so much fun and you can make so many brilliant sort of textures and marks and it can really yeah. be um technically interesting as well as fun to do you know so so all of that really like and and I have uh, you know my cabinet of curiosities I'm looking over there now I I'll pick up a little stone or a shell or something that's okay to take obviously I wouldn't take things that are um shouldn't be taken out of the environment but I just keep little little memories and treasures you know a half broken blue eggshell from my garden and things like that just to remind me of the richness of color or shape or memory making yeah. where I was when I found it and all of those things really help inspire you you might not paint a blue egg but you might use that blue against something else in another painting you know so so many I love that idea colors. of like bringing some of those bits of nature and just keeping that like that presence right in front of you that little collection I do love beach combing or hunting through yeah. nature and just like bringing those little bits obviously in certain areas you wouldn't want to do that but in a lot of places you go for a, a hike even uh in your own parks or you know the brush beside your house finding that that night and I take pictures of mushrooms too like the colors of mushrooms. Oh, I just did that um, at the weekend <laughs> unbelievable what you can use like if you're just using your camera and taking pictures of it yeah, yeah. those ideas in but yeah there's always that like the moss that's growing on the on the stick and I'm like I gotta bring that home because there's something about the texture the color and even like you said I might not be painting that specific thing but it, like just the, the energy of it the influence of it really does help transform the joy in creating I'm always inspired by nature and I do love that you're giving us the opportunity to play with our hands again and and making yep. a really playful um project and meaningful project as well yeah. um but yeah you have a you have a knack for that which is why I would encourage anyone who's listening to go and do your sketchbook magic course because it oh, really yeah. gives you that chance to get out in nature and use it as inspiration and some really playful projects and it's only what 29 pounds 27, 27, 27 pounds. So it's yeah. really a nice entry point to connect with Kelly and her philosophies about making art mm -hmm. and her, the way she, you use nature and play and magic and symbolism and just all that feel good for creating to live the creative life. Cause you're really a big encourager of, of that in your message and your, in your work and whatnot. So. Yeah. 
yeah and if you don't want to go out and be in nature i each lesson i i go out and i, I go to nature for you as well so what you can, makes it so fun to see you and you can just watch places. you can just watch me doing it and go oh yeah, yeah she's gonna get sunburned or oh yeah that cloud looks like it's gonna rain any minute yeah yep, exactly you always take everyone on an adventure in your projects so i have asked this already but we can still keep dreaming big i love to talk about your big audacious dreams yeah i know you have quite a few so I yeah i do i mean there's yeah, the camp of traveling van, but, but yeah, I know yeah. There's more yes there is and i think actually it does come back to that uh thing that i said earlier about you know what's the biggest conversation i can have with the universe like i literally want to know what the earth sounds like if it spoke to me which i know is getting a bit woo woo and a bit hippie for people but to me you know and i i am trying to really explore that and i as you know i'm a huge um sort of fan not a fan that sounds like a rock band oh god that's a that's an irony because i'm talking about stones and that's a rock band but i'm a huge sort of um I'm, i'm hugely drawn to and interested in definitely the celtic west i mean britain is the entire celtic west of europe but the celtic west of britain and ireland and looking at ancient stone circles and ancient um, stone glyphs and processional pathways, ritual landscapes. And I think that's where I really want to delve into a lot more this, uh, this kind of coming 12 months or so with my art is how do I ritualize landscape and creativity? And how do I step into landscapes that either were a ritual landscape for other people? You know, Stonehenge is a great example of that. Or how do I create ritual in my own landscapes of my own choosing and how does that inform the creativity that kind of flows from there so I guess tying like you said this mind body soul connection this this universe connectivity with ritual which is kind of like a language of connection isn't it with something greater than you ritual is a is kind of like a portal to being connected to other things and that's what we've used rituals for so how can I now start to explore ritual and landscape and you know and here's something that the earth has got to say to me that would be like my biggest dream so will you be taking the people who join you for your retreat next year because i know you're not having one this year but next year on that same kind of journey yeah so it's cool about what you offer it's more than just making art it's like this encompasses all of it like i would like please lead me in this please i would like i know sign up in a heartbeat for what you're talking about the portal the ritual it does create something it's so beautiful yeah and and i think creativity and nature rituals together are even more powerful because our creativity is our way that we reflect how we understand the world you know our sensory understanding of the world so so on the retreat we do quite a lot of nature-based things even down to like wild bathing in this icy pool that runs down off the moors and has this gorgeous waterfall in it all the way through to um last time i was actually doing some reiki healing for a lady and we were lying in the meadow on the hill and the sunshine was out and all the bumblebees were just buzzing around us and oh oh, honestly it was just beautiful so there's so many things that kind of unfold and what i said to the ladies who joined me on on the retreat last time was you know spend the whole time here as though everything you see and hear and and sense is a message for you, that it was meant for you. Like, what if that tree blowing towards the sunshine is like a message for you to look towards the positive, you know, spend the whole time here taking everything as meaning. And um, that's quite transformative as well. Very transformative. Um, yeah, just make sure that I'm first on your list to sign up. And if I can make it to, <laughs> you have to get to the UK, yeah, I would for sure. Well, you know, it's on my bucket list and to see I you do. in person one day because you're amazing. And I really appreciate you being not just part of virtual art, summit, but part of my life and a friend. Oh, thank I you. can call a friend, the two Kellys here. So um, I could just talk to you forever, but I'm going to wrap it up right there and let everybody know. Good idea. You get to find Kelly Herrick and enjoy the Virtual Arts Summit and our return to play and your very unique way of exploring that, that no one else is really exploring from your point of view in the summit. And I appreciate it so much. Oh, you're so welcome. Everyone just have the best time and just have fun with it. I'm so excited to see what everybody's going to create. I know it's going to be amazing. So thank you. Thank you.